Alright, let's see here. Make sure that that is set. Let's check my box. Oh no, we don't want that. We want one. That should be a little bit better quality audio for everyone as you enter the room. A little scatterbrained here today. All right. We'll see how many people show up today. Good afternoon, Gene. We'll wait a couple minutes here. Um. Oh, man. <clears throat> we will see um, if uh, the Facebook screenshot of this Bible study is as meme worthy as it was uh, one of the days last week. So that was entertaining for me. I think it grabs the first few seconds. So it's going to teach me to, I don't know, not make weird faces. I, we'll find out. It's all exciting in the Facebook world. Welcome, everybody. Hello, Linda, Terry Lynn, Mike McKim. How are you doing today? And Suzanne, hello. Good afternoon. We are gearing up to make some headway in the saga. It's not really a, I wouldn't say a love story. It's a saga of uh, Jacob and, well, his four wives. So, let's see here. How many people are in the room? Oh, quite a few. Oh, we're almost at a quorum, I think. Starting roughly on time today. I hope all of you who are able to enjoy the... Uh, were able to enjoy the virtual conference, were able to do so live. If not, uh, it's still available. It's all there. So, if you've got you know, a, a login, you can just log in and the whole thing is there waiting for you if you haven't done that or if you've watched it once and you can watch it again. Um, there are 15, I believe, breakaways uh, for your gospel enjoyment. Um, I taught one of them, Pastor Borkhart. I don't think he did one. He did two of the plenaries though. So there's that gift for you. Um, so check out, check out the uh, virtual conference, still able to do so. Still a great gift from higher things to you uh, in these uh, crazy times, able to enjoy that conference in your own home if need be. Uh, Terry Lynn, where is the, the Mr. Nat? Yeah, I don't know where he's at. Hopefully, He's not around today. I did just kill a fly upstairs, so you know, there's that. He won't come down to bother me. That's good. So, without any further ado, and I just uh, fritter away our time, we will begin in Genesis 29. Not that I really want to, but, well, you'll see what I mean. It's where we ended last week. So we are in Genesis chapter 29. Jacob is living with Laban, working for, uh, in order to marry um, Rachel. So this is what he says after he works seven years. And Jacob says to Laban, um, Give me my wife, because my days are fulfilled, and that I may and I will go into her. Yeah, it's a little. It's there's no uh, fixing that one. It's gross. Um, and I mentioned this last week. There's lots of euphemisms that we have in the scriptures. So Adam knew his wife. Um, Isaac was comforted, um, but then we've get we've got this isn't even a euphemism. This is just gross. Um, uh, or you get the the lie with somebody. That's another sort of hidden way of talk a euphemism for it. Um, or um, which is sort of a negative one. Lying with someone is a negative one. Um, or rise up to play. That's another one of the children of Israel around the golden calf. That's another bad one. Um, obviously, knowing intimacy is is a prized thing, and um, also being comforted. That's a, that's a good gift. Here we just have gross, and we see that how far we've come in our sinfulness. There's no there's no way to try and 
absolve Jacob of of talking this way about his future wife. It's just it's it's disgusting. Um, but it's we're sinners, and this is what we do, especially with with something as a every one of God's gifts gets destroyed. Um, the gifts he often protects with the Ten Commandments. So marriage is protected with the Sixth Commandment. And what do we do with the Sixth Commandment? What do we do with marriage? Well, look at what Jacob does with it, how he talks about it. It's crude. And um, as we will see, there's lots going on that is not something to be emulated. It's not a, it's, this is not a positive example. This is a negative example. But we will get to that in just a minute. So, okay, Laban um, gathers all the men of the place and he makes a feast, marriage feast, wedding feast, uh, exciting times. Just had vacation where I, I was able to go to a wedding, officiated a wedding for um, my wife's cousin. Um, and it happened in the evening. Uh, he took Leah, his daughter, and gave her to him. And he went in to her. Um, so that's what Laban does instead. He throws a feast and then gives Leah away instead. Um, and Laban gave to her Zilpah, his female servant, uh, f for Leah, his daughter, as a servant. Okay, so. And in the morning, and behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not uh, serve with you for Rachel? And um, why have you deceived me? Um, so here we see, as I talked about last week, Jacob meets his match, right? So his mother, Rebecca, always had a plan and Laban also has a plan, and we will see that here in just a minute. So Jacob has met his match. What have you done to me? Uh, you've tricked me, deceived me, um, given me this other daughter that I didn't marry. The, as it's put earlier, the she's not called ugly. She's called the one with with soft eyes. So there's a there's a euphem a kind euphemism about it, but and we'll get to why eventually. Um, but I don't want to steal because that's much later in the story. Um, well, not much further, but I don't want to steal possibly my own thunder or Pastor Borkhart's thunder. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but what does Laban say about this? Um, we don't do it this way here in our country um, to give the younger before the firstborn. So Leah's older, so he says there's this custom where the younger daughter is not given away before the the eldest um and so then he says um complete this seven days and i will give to you also um the other one uh, in so that you would serve for me um another seven years so there's the trick if i can have jacob work for me for seven years without pay I mean, he has to supply, uh, you know, food and shelter, th those sorts of things. But he doesn't have to pay them. Well, it's basically free labor. If I can do that for seven years for one daughter, well, I can get an, I can get fourteen years. That's Laban's trick. Um, and so that's that's what Laban is up to. Jacob meets his match, a little bit. There's more that Jacob has up his sleeve at the end of chapter 30. Uh, but I don't know if we'll get there this week. Um, and Jacob did so. He filled up uh, her seven days, her week, and he, he gave Rachel to him, his, Rachel, his daughter, to him for a wife. So it's sort of this contract you can have Rachel now, but you've got to work seven years. So instead of it being like he, at least Laban isn't a complete jerk about it. He's kind of a jerk about it, but he's not a complete jerk. Um, and he gives, Lab and Laban gives to Rachel, his daughter, Bilhah, his female servant for her female servant. 
Okay. And Jacob also went in to Rachel. And he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with him another seven, uh, up to another seven years. Um, so he's, he gets two wives and we saw this already with Abraham. Um, this is good. let me fix it. Uh, we saw that with Abraham. Abraham marries, um, Sarah, and then he also marries Hagar and that doesn't turn out well. So we are far from Genesis 1 and 2, where the Lord makes them male and female, where, where Adam and Eve, one man, one woman. And this is not... Uh, huh. The story is laid out in such a way that we do not get the idea that this is a smart move on Jacob's part. And we'll see this throughout the rest of the chapter, the way things go and how Jacob comes about having... Um, well, by the end of the chapter, 11 sons and one daughter. Um, he, um, did he marry Hagar? No, it was more like a concubine, but it was still sort of, it's, she was sort of like kind of a wife. So it's, it's still not good. We, that's the point is that what Abraham does with Sarah and Hagar is not good. It does not bring good things into the Abraham's household. There's no, like, if one wife is good, two wives are great. That's not what we get here. It's that one wife is great, and that's the gift. Um, I mean, Rachel, uh, not Rachel, um, Isaac and Rebecca have enough problems, and they're, um, and there are just one man, one woman. Adam and Eve did too. But here, Jacob is really going to have a lot of problems in his household, because, well, as we'll find out very quickly, he doesn't just end up with two wives. He has four. So it ends up being, you know, one wife is a gift. And then uh, if you add wives, then it becomes double double trouble or triple trouble or quadruple trouble. Um, and one wife isn't trouble. That's not the point. It's one wife, great gift. After that, not so much a gift and things go sideways pretty quick. Um, and you would see this if we would also uh, look at Solomon, who has lots of wives, lots of wives. And he was faithful. And then suddenly, because of his so many wives, Solomon, who built the temple, starts building altars to false gods to make his wives happy. And so we start seeing multiple wives, not a good thing. David ends up the same way. Um, I'm forgetting right now if Saul, if that's described for Saul. But I can't, I can't remember that. I know for David and Solomon run into trouble, as does Jacob here. So this is a negative example. It's not something to be emulated in how Jacob treats his wives um, and, his, and his concubines. It is no good what Jacob does. So let's see here. And when uh, Yahweh saw that Leah was hated. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Um, and Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, because, she said, Yahweh has seen uh, my affliction. Because, uh, uh, because now my husband will love me. And it's not just this way um, with, with Reuben. So Reuben comes from the, the, the same word for to see. Uh, uh, Reuven uh, from Ra'ah, which is to see. So Yahweh sees. Um, all these names have, have uh, sort of uh, Leah's story. And you can just hear the pain 
in what she says about why her son is named this. So Yahweh has seen my affliction. Okay. Um, and now my husband will love me. That's just, that's terrible. They're, they're husband and wife, and there is no love there. Obviously, there's the, the marital relationship there, um, but there's no love. And she's, she's echoing that in the, in the name. It's very, very sad for Leah. And she bears, uh, conceives again and bears another son. And she, and she uh, said, uh, because Yahweh heard that I am hated, he has given to me also this son, this, this male child. And she called his name Simeon, which comes from the Hebrew word for um, here, Shema, Shim, Shimon is what it is. So he's still hearing that I'm hated. So Jacob doesn't just get one son, two sons, two, an heir and a spare, I guess, if you want to go that route. Sons are important in the ancient world, especially. So he gets two sons from Leah, the wife he doesn't love. Um, and we'll keep going here. And she again conceived and bore a son. And she said, um, now this time my husband will cling to me because I have borne to him three sons. Therefore, she called his name uh, Levi. Levi coming from the word to, to cling to or attach to me. So he'll, he'll be on my side, my husband. Now my husband will be on my side. I've borne him three sons. It doesn't sound like things are happy in Jacob's household, especially in how Jacob is treating his wife. It's terrible. This is not good. This is what sinners do. And if we could sort of maybe whitewash um, what Abraham and Isaac did up to this point, it's getting harder to do with Jacob. Super hard to do to whitewash what he's doing. And this is where we're going to get into some gospel trouble here. That's the whole point, is that this can't be about, this can't be a book about the patriarchs. It can't be. Not complete. I mean, they're the sort of the object of the story, but it's not really about them. It's about Yahweh saving them and choosing them. He's actually the actor because these are terrible patriarchs. Terrible founding fathers. Terrible. A man who treats his wife this way. Or he's married, and the honorable thing to do would be like, well, that's my wife. Instead, no, I don't want this one. Give me the other one. And then the Lord is trying to show Jacob, this is the wife I've given you. You've taken, this is the gift. You've taken the other one as not gift. Um, so here she will bear sons, right now three sons, and still no love, none. Because it, And it's not, this isn't to, to say, you know, again, this is about the Lord saving them and using Jacob to bring about where the Savior will be born. Uh, 35. Um, and, and, well, this would be another aside when it comes to, I guess, the historicity of the book. Um, so often if you look at ancient um, chronicles of kings or uh, nations, the negatives are really downplayed. In the Bible, the negatives are almost amplified. Um, to again, probably not amplified. They're just, they're shown. They're not covered up uh, because this is a book about God saving his people. Not about the Lord choosing awesome people and saying, yes, everything about you is right, and that's why I've chosen you. No, it's, you're messed up. You're gross. You're sinners. And I'm choosing you to save you. That's what I'm doing. That's the sort of God we have. The God who saves the likes of Jacob, well, then he'll save you and me too. He'll save me. Um, that's the comfort. And, and Luther talks about this too when it comes to the apostles. We look at the apostles, they're not very good. Look at Peter. 
He always puts his foot in his mouth. He doesn't get it. And that is to give us comfort that Jesus made promises to them to save them. And so that same promise of salvation to them, well, it's going to count for me too in my sins. He's going to save me from my sins. He saved Peter from his. He saved Jacob from his. Um, 35. And she conceived again and bore a son. And she said, uh, This time I will praise Yahweh. Therefore, she called his name Judah, uh, which comes from to praise Yahweh, Yehuda. Um, and then she um, ceased bearing. Okay, so she's four sons. Um, and yeah, this one is a little bit better. So she shifted. Um, if we want to see kind of what's going on with Leah is that she's given up her hope of being loved um, by her husband and now she has all eyes on the Lord. There's no hope in Jacob. There's only hope in Yahweh. So she's, she's now um, fully in the Lord's hands here. Um, that's what I, that's what I see in this shift in names is that she's suddenly no longer bemoaning the lack of love from her husband and rejoicing fully in the love that Yahweh has for her and continually um, blessing her and caring for her. Um, and Rachel saw that she did not uh, bear for Jacob. Um, she envied. Uh, her sister and she said to Jacob give me children give me sons um, or if there will not be I will die wow okay and Jacob anger was burning against Rachel and he said um Am I in the place of God who has withhold, uh, withheld fruit from your womb from you? <sighs> Ouch. That doesn't sound good. So much for loving Rachel more than Leah. Um, he at least is happy that he's got four sons. I mean, um, and here, here we go. Here we go. Then she said, look, um, uh, Here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give mirth on my behalf, uh, that I may have children through her. Boy. The, um, the, uh, yeah. Hmm. Here. Have my have my servant. Okay. And um Yeah. So she gave uh to him Bilha, her servant, for a wife. Yeah, this got PG thirteen in a hurry. It did. And he went into her, Jacob did. And Bilha conceived and bore Jacob a son. And Rachel said, um, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given to me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Dan means, is from the Hebrew word for to judge. Okay. Um, and Jacob, uh, and she conceived a, again, and she bore, uh, Bilhah did, um, Rachel's servant, a second son. And Rachel said, um, with, um, I have wrestlings of, I have wrestled wrestlings with God. 
and with my sister. Uh, wait, with... Oh, this is interesting. With wrestlings of God, I have wrestled with my sister. Um, and um, I have prevailed. She called his name Naphtali. Um, so wrestling is Naphtali's name. Um, we'll just keep trugging pushing through here to get to the end of the suns. That's where I want to get so I can talk about. So let's see here. So, um, and Leah saw that she had stopped from bearing and she took Zilpah, her female servant, and gave her to Jacob for a wife. Oh boy. So now we're up to wife number four. And Zilpah... Leah's female servant bore Jacob a son. Of course she did. Of course she did. Um, we start seeing that the Lord... Um, uh, uh, Jacob should have gotten the memo with the four sons, but the Lord here, we, if we want to sort of think about how the Lord's judgment sometimes work, oh, is this what you want? Well, the Lord gives him what he wants. You want four wives? Well, I'll give you sons from all these wives. Um... And Leah said, um, fortune has come. Um, and so she called his name Gad. Gad means uh, fortune, good fortune. And Zilpah bore uh, a second son. Of course she did. And Leah said, um, happy am I. Because now women um, have called me happy. So she called his name Asher blessed or happy oh boy so now jacob's up to four plus two plus two. we got eight um right yes we are up to eight sons oh boy in the days of wheat harvest reuben went and found mandrakes in the field um, and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Oh, boy. Because, you know, that's what we need is aphrodisiacs and fertility helps. That's what we got going on here. That's what's all going on with the mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrake? Also, Rachel said that he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. This is just awesome. Oh, God. Ah, we are. This is not good. Like, you have to laugh because it's ridiculously awful. It really is awful. That they're now bartering with each other to spend a night with Jacob. Ah. Ah. So Jacob comes in from the field. Leah went out to him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. Great. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Of course she did. Why wouldn't she? Fifth son. Now we're up to uh, four, six, eight. This is number nine. Leah said... God has given to me my wages uh, because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. So Leah sort of here recognizes possibly a, an error in judgment that yes, um, the two sons born from, if I can, let's keep it straight, Zilpah, um, are sort of hers, but not really. And so she's um, um, she sort of reckons. Leah conceived again. Ooh, sixth son. There we go. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with good endowment. Um, now my husband will honor me. 
because I have borne him six sons, so she called his name um, Zebulun. Um, uh, to honor. And so here we're kind of circled back around. Now it's like, She's winning the, the war of the children. That's what's going on. So she's sort of, um, huh, in a some sense, maybe this, uh, there's lots packed in here. So it's, you know, trying to, I'm trying to understand their motives, which maybe we can't fully, fully do with just little snippets of, of phrases here. God's given me my wages. So she gets another son, even though she's given her servant. So maybe what she's trying to do here is sort of cancel those kids out of the reckoning, right? So um, it's, it's I've had four sons, now I've got five. So let's not count those other two. Um, let's not count those other two because now I've got five. I don't need uh, these other sons. I've got five. Now I've got six, six sons to my name, and I don't care about those other four. All I know is that my husband will honor me and he won't honor Rachel. That's what's going on. This is this war over children, war over Jacob, because, you know, four wives, one wife, awesome, four wives, awesomer. No, four wives, terrible idea. Um, and Jacob, being the sinner that he is, is like, whatever. Um... Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Um, and God remembered Rachel and listened, and God listened to her, and he opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son. Of course, she did, had to be a son. And she called, uh, and she said, God add to me uh, God has taken away my reproach and she uh, and she called his name Joseph saying Yahweh add to me another son may the Lord add to me another son okay and this is well we might read a little bit more um, uh, so we've got now so, is that 10 sons and one daughter? No, 11 sons, one daughter. If I can do the math, there's only one son left. Um, and we won't get his birth uh, for, uh, it's either in this, the end of this chapter or the beginning of the next. And all this while we see that this is, there's no way that this is good. If we wanted it to sort of be Oh, sort of neither here nor there, you know, take four wives, don't take four wives, do whatever you want. Um, the spirit would have inspired Moses to sort of put it in a different way, right? We could have just been told Jacob um, worked with Laban for 14 years and, and uh, as he worked with Laban, took Rachel and Leah, Laban's daughters as wives, and also took their servants as wives. Um, we could have just been told that. And then these are the names of his sons that they bore him. And just laid all laid it all out, like a typical genealogy would have done. Like we've, we've had thus far in Genesis. When we start getting this many names, we sort of just get a list. Um, but he doesn't do that. The Spirit doesn't do that for us. Um, because then we'd be left with, well, God seems okay with this. We are told all the nitty-gritty, gross details of what sinners are doing in this marriage. The understanding being, don't do this. This is not good. There's no way this is good. This is this is not good in in, in an ancient culture. It's not good now. It's not good. Um, we need a flow chart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I taught um, 
third and fourth grade religion class for a few years and did the Old Testament. We did not get into the nitty gritty details of some of these stories. Um, I simply told them um, he took four wives, which was not good. And he had however many kids, a flow chart. And um, the family tree gets really hard after this. It becomes very difficult to sort of fill out, you know, a family tree of four wives and all the sons. Um, it gets very complex. In the same way that it's sort of complex on Abraham's end, um, where he's marrying his his sister and his net niece marries an uncle. You know, it's very complex and it's not good. Um, so it sort of bookends the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham is a messy sort of marriage in his house and along with his father's house. Um, and then you end up with Jacob and this is just a train wreck of a marriage. Train wreck of a marriage. Um, and we see that it doesn't just affect, it would be bad enough if it were two wives who were strangers. And we saw that with Hagar and Sarai or Sarah and two different women, unrelated women. And it was not good. It was not good. Um, and here we get two sisters. And the, the subtle undertone is these two sisters now hate each other. They hate each other. All because of what Jacob has sort of allowed to happen with his with his marriages. Um, it's just, it's disgusting. And we should, Jacob should be ashamed. And, well, how does this all turn out? Well, the Lord saves them. Um, and Jacob, uh, we're not told when or, or how, but he actually comes to understand this, that the wife of promise is not Rachel. The wife of promise is Leah, that his firstborn sons, um, the son of promise is coming from Leah. We won't get into which son it's which son and why yet. Um, and the reason I can say that is later on in the story, uh, when Rachel dies, she is buried um, kind of where they are, wherever they are. Um, there's no move to sort of go back to where the, the other patriarchs are buried. But when it comes to Leah, she is buried in the family plot. The wife that, um, as we're told here, Jacob does not love. But she becomes, in his mind, the wife of promise. That she is buried in the tomb of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah. He buries Leah there. He does not cart Rachel back there. And we, we see this move um, time and again. Uh, well, a few examples of it where um, Abraham is buried with Sarah and then Isaac and, and Rebecca are buried there. And then even Joseph chooses to be buried back with his father uh, in that family plot. So that becomes very important um, in, in understanding for... Um, uh, it illuminates how Jacob understands what the Lord has done in his life and is sort of a recognition that um, he went down the wrong way because if if Jacob had sort of held on to where he started we would expect Rachel to be buried in the family plot but she's not she's buried near um, Bethlehem um, but not, I mean, it's not far from Bethlehem to where um, Abraham is buried. I mean, it's doable to transport her back, but he doesn't do that. And so uh, I kind of move a little ahead in the story to let us know, um, to have this eye towards not just this messed up family um, and to not emulate it, which is part of it. I mean, written as, a, as like a negative example for us. Don't do this. This is not good. Um, but again, this is about the Savior. 
in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, Jacob. And you're like, in this guy? Well, it's not about in Jacob. It's about, as I, as I said uh, last week, um, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed and in your seed. So that is not in Jacob, but in his seed, in the promised Savior. That's what this is all about. And that comes about through uh, Leah, not through Rachel. It's through Judah. Uh, fourth son down. Um, and as the saga continues, we find out why. Um, uh, it's the fourth born son and not the first born son. If we thought this was crazy, it gets crazier. And Pastor Lestico is correct. Jesus comes from messy families for messy families. And if you remember, if you were there with Pastor Borkhart when he did Matthew, and he lays out the genealogy of Jesus, there are times when um, the messiness of the family tree is, is laid bare. And that's what this story in the patriarchs is doing. Jesus, uh, sinless, but he is born of sinners for the sake of sinners, to bear their sins. So Jesus, being a descendant of Jacob, takes on the sins of Jacob um, to save Jacob from them so that he would no longer be Jacob this... It, you almost get the feeling that if, if Rachel or Leah had had the idea to find some other woman to bring into the circle, to sort of bring hatred towards their sister or win the war, this war of children, they would have done it. They would have done it. And Jacob would have gone along for the ride. And the Lord's like, yeah, I need to save you from this because there's no possible way that you will save yourself. In fact, you'll just dig yourself deeper into sin and death. That's the way we go. Um, well, if this sin is getting me a, a problem, I'll go over here and try and fix this. And we see what happens when sinners try to fix things. We actually make things worse because we will do it selfishly um, and not for the sake of our neighbor. So Jacob is not acting in any sort of way in love towards Leah or love for Rachel for that matter. It's a, it's a, it's a corrupted love. Um, certainly not love for Bilhah and Zilpah. Uh, but this is the, the family, um, that Jesus saves. Jesus saves Jacob and Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah and all of the sons. Um, and he saves Abraham and Isaac. He saves Sarah and Rebecca. He saves Hagar and Ishmael. As, as we remember looking at those, uh, how Ishmael dies, Ishmael um, has faith in Yahweh, has faith in this promise, because that's this is what Abraham... Um, Isaac and Jacob are preaching. This is what they're preaching. This promised Savior. Um, who's going to come and save them? Because looking at this story, they need it. And it's not just they need it. All families. We need it too. Um, in all the various ways that, that sin uh, breaks out in our lives, where we, um, where we, the first commandment especially is just, disregarded and then that works itself out as we treat our neighbors um, the people we are given as a gift will either um, try and take other gifts we or we um, we take the gift for granted um, the Lord saves us from this he's the savior of sinners he's the friend of sinners um, he becomes sin um, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. And so, um, blessed are all nations in Jesus. Righteousness of God in Jesus. Jacob is the righteousness of God in Jesus. Not in Jacob. In Jacob, he runs this way and is a horrible sinner who needs to repent. And how things work out later on in the story, we, we see that he does. But it's not about even his repenting. It's about this seed who comes to die and rise for Jacob so that Jacob would rise from the dead and live forever in righteousness and purity forever. And this is the same promise that the Lord Jesus uh, gives to us. 
that he dies and rises for us, that we would uh, rise from the dead and live before him in righteousness and purity forever, as the Catechism says. Gifts given to us, um, that gift given to us uh, in the word and gifts of, uh, in the word and the sacraments. So with that, um, thank you for joining me. I'm one minute over time. Um, so please come back tomorrow uh, and hang out with Pastor Borkart as he continues to work through Genesis. Hope you all have a good rest of your day.